It's your boy, Mr. Faith. As you know, SummerSlam just happened. Like, they just wrapped it up. Uh, so, of course, I got to do a quick little recap for you guys. Drop my reaction for you guys. Uh, we're going to talk about each match individually, of course. And then we'll talk about the, the show as a whole. And I'll even touch up and give my opinion on some things happening in WWE at the moment, you know, along the way. And I'll be honest, we're, we're not going to waste any of you guys' time. I'm just going to ask you to remember to like and subscribe if you like the content and uh, also give it a disclaimer if it looks like i'm like reading off of something it's because i am so much happened in this episode of SummerSlam tonight that i had to take notes like i knew i was going to do this recap and about like three matches and i was like you know what i should probably take notes <laughs> like, that's it, it was already by that point you could just tell that it was going to be a chaotic night and it and it was it was i'm glad i took the notes so before we even have a match Right, we see another promo from the same person we saw at Money in the Bank, and it was, but this time it was like I'm coming tonight, right? But you could kind of see like the like they tried to do like just an outline, but you could kind of see like details of the person's face and their hair and stuff. And I was like, "Yo, that looks like Edge <laughs> to me." At first, at, at first when it was like I'm coming tonight, blah blah, blah I was like, oh, "Okay, like it's probably gonna be because Riddle's injured, so it'll probably someone just making their debut versus Seth Rollins." But then I got saying, "I'm like, and that looks like Edge, and that looks like." Like, Edge is, uh, like, Edge just looks like Edge. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, hmm. And so, sure enough, it, it was. We find out later, and, and we'll get more into that later. But, I, I, like, I don't think that they meant to be as obvious as they were. So, I don't, I don't know how to really judge that. But first match of the night, Bianca Belair versus Becky Lynch. Honestly, this could have gone either way, and I could see WWE making a good storyline either way. You know, even if Becky Lynch won and they just ran it back. But, you know, the, Bianca did end up winning. And... Uh, to be honest, like I said, I'm totally okay with that. I think that WWE is really heel heavy when it comes to the women. So it makes sense that you have some face champions so that they can constantly get, you know, new opponents, new challengers, and, and not have, be like face on face action or heel versus heels all the time. So I think that makes sense. And of course, when Bianca won, you know, Bailey, Bailey's music hits, Bailey comes out and she's like, ah, I remember me. So it's like, okay, now you're thinking we're going to get Bianca versus Bailey. But then all of a sudden, Dakota Kai comes out, uh, Io Shirai comes out, and so then it looks like, okay, they're getting called up from NXT, and they're probably going to be under the tutelage of uh, Bayley, and so we're probably going to have a nice little faction. And then they march down to the ring together while Bianca's still in the ring. And after Bianca had won against Becky, Becky had kind of like shook her hand, did a little sign of sportsmanship. So then they walk out, They start, like they, they, the three of them get in the ring with Bianca, and then Becky hops in the ring and Stan, like, joins forces basically with Bianca. So I don't know if this is, like, a face turn for Becky, which which I could, we could use. Because, like I said, there's so many heels and they just introduced, like, like one just returned and they just introduced two more. So that they could definitely use some more faces, definitely, for the women. So all of that, like, match actually makes sense. Plus, you get a little bit of that. I thought that SummerSlam was going to be, like, a total crap show. But you get a little bit of that, um, like, changing of the guards type feeling with this show, which I didn't think was really going to happen because these big shows are kind of already, like, booked and, and you know, solid. Um, like, but at the time that everything was happening, happened this week. And we'll get more into that at the end of the video. I will say the match quality as a whole between Bianca Belair and Becky, I was like... Eh, at first, but then all of a sudden, Becky hit this, like, amazing, like, flipped over Bianca, hit her with a stunner, and from there, the match picked up. They had a good spot uh, where Becky, like, barely beat the 10 count to get back into the ring for the count out, and then, and, like, Bian like, Bianca was actually trying to drag her, and then after a while, she's like, I give up, man. I'm just gonna roll back in the ring, and so she rolled back in the ring at, like, a count of eight, and then, like, uh, Becky bare like I don't even know if she really beat it to be honest. Like, that's how close it was. And then they did a cool spot where they were both on the top of the turnbuckle and Bianca like pushed Becky down. And as she was coming down, she grabbed Bianca's braid and she pulled Bianca down with her. Uh, that was a cool spot. Uh, other than that, nothing really much to write home about like in the actual match. Next match was the Miz versus Logan Paul. My first thoughts of this match honestly was why are they wearing the same ring gear? Like, <laughs> they matched perfectly. Literally, The Miz was still wearing, not his exact same ring gear from WrestleMania, but he was still wearing the color scheme, and Maurice and Champa were, like, wearing the same, like, color scheme and design. Like, it was definitely the same design idea for the, the ring gear. And then Logan Paul was wearing 
his same ring gear for WrestleMania when they were a tag team. So they obviously match then, so they match now. If you honestly, if you look at it, Logan Paul matched Maurice and Tommaso Ciampa better than The Miz did, like once they were in the ring. So I, that to me was just like kind of weird, I guess. Um, I do love seeing this pairing though. I, I think The Miz is just an incredibly safe worker. So I feel like The Miz can have a match with anybody and make that other person look, even, even if it makes The Miz look bad. Uh, I think the Miz is really good at sacrificing him himself, and he'll make a botch if it means making the other person look good. I think that we often say that the the Miz doesn't have uh like that technical ability, but I think that it's really he's just an incredibly safe worker. Uh, the only problem that I have with this, of course, is that they're both heels. Like the Miz is probably. The most, not the biggest, but he's probably the most heel heel that you have in the company. Like, at no point in his career has he ever been a face. Uh, he will never be a face. <laughs> and people just absolutely love to hate him. And the only thing I can think is that WWE knows that. And so they're putting Logan Paul against The Miz in order to make Logan Paul a face. Even though, he, I mean, for him to be a face, it would take a miracle. Okay, he is also definitely going to be a heel i hope that wwe realizes that and they maybe use this to kind of have the miz take logan paul under his wing or something i don't know but the whole heel on heel thing and and you can tell that they're trying to make paul a face because they even have like aj styles come out in the match at one point you know tomasa champa starts to get too involved so then aj styles comes out you know takes out tomasa champa uh so they're definitely trying hard to push logan as a face but i just don't ever see it happening that being said though so so um after aj style comes out right uh logan paul hits the miz with a phenomenal forearm and <laughs> Corey grave goes oh well, it's not a phenomenal i wouldn't call it a phenomenal forearm and a pretty good forearm but i wouldn't call it a phenomenal one and that just kind of cracked me up i thought it was worth mentioning also they had like a, a an announce table spot i wasn't expecting that on the second match of the night uh just logan paul doing the frog splash like on the Miz through the announce table and I did think it was cool that he uh off the distraction you know he hit the Miz with his own like skull crushing finale put him out of commish I gotta say YouTuber aside like if you and I think if anyone looks at this objectively if Logan Paul wasn't a successful YouTube let's not even let's not even say that if Logan Paul wasn't a YouTuber and didn't have the reputation he had before entering WWE if you just saw this 26, 27-year-old person just now entering the ring, making their debut on WrestleMania, looking good in the debut, and then you know having a follow-up match on SummerSlam, looking good in the follow-up match, you would be highly interested in this person. You would definitely think that this person is like the future of WWE and all of that good stuff. So... If he is going to be serious about this, this is the question that I think everyone has and that the reason that people are doubting him so much. If he is going to take this seriously, since he has officially been signed by WWE, I don't know what period of time he's been signed for is the thing. And I don't think anyone does. Um, I, I can expect that since he's been actually signed by WWE, if he takes it seriously, he could have a long, successful WWE career. Uh, he definitely looks good in the ring. He's used to, you know, trash talking and stuff like that. So his promo work, while it needs a little bit of polishing to be like at the WWE delivery style, you know, he's really ready. I think, uh, his definitely is in ring work His, you know, he's got a few things that he's, he's worked on. You can tell, but then there's also a few things he hasn't worked on. And I don't really think he has his own finisher and things like that. So, there are definitely aspects of his in-ring work that need to be polished, but I think he's, for his age and for his experience, like, wrestling, I think that he's phenomenal, and if he takes it seriously, he can probably be uh, pretty spectacular. Other than that, though, the, the match overall, I mean, it was like, eh, it, it, it wasn't bad, but it wasn't, like I said, two heel versus heel. I just wasn't that very interested in it. Then we saw this weird promo with, like, Mansoor and some other person. They were, like, models, and they were thirsty, and it was, like, a Pure Life water commercial, and L.A. Knight was in it. It was just weird. Like, it was just straight up weird. But it was a good breakup between that match and then the following match, which was Austin Theory 
versus Bobby Lashley. Um, of course, Theory did ambush Bobby Lashley as he was getting in the ring with the briefcase. So I thought mm, maybe Theory has a, a super quick win and they give him the title and, and he has the title and the briefcase and that could be interesting. No, it just angered Bobby Lashley even more. Uh, and this match went exactly the way that uh, you thought it should go. Really, the only way it could go was with Bobby Lashley winning, but not before he put Austin Theory through just enough punishment that you pretty much knew he wasn't going to be cashing in tonight. Like, to think that you could have a match and then possibly cash in against Brock Lesnar and Roman Reigns on the same night uh, seems, I don't know, kind of kind of weird, I guess. Uh, but he, you know, put him in the herlock and finished him off and... So it's kind of like, may there like there was there was still a possibility for him to cash in, but you pretty much knew like he's not cashing in tonight. Next match was Judgment Day versus the Mysterios, and I didn't understand like the only thing that I have about this match is I didn't understand the no DQ, but you can only have one legal man concept. Like if it's no if it's truly no disqualification, right? <laughs> like. Especially as I'll, I'll kind of describe this to you guys, and you can kind of judge this for yourself. But if it's truly no disqualification, then why can't both men from each team be in the ring at the same time? Doesn't make any sense to me at all. Like, oh, you're going to get counted to five, and you guys are going to be just, oh, wait, there's no disqualification. Well, you guys are just going to lose the match. <laughs> you know, both of you guys are in the ring at the same time. Like, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, the match, though, was actually a pretty good match. It started off hot, fast paced. The Mysterios, you know, were on top. Rey Mysterio, at one point in the match, did this springboard moonsault where he just, like, flew. Like, he, he just, he was, he literally took flight. Like, he, I, it wasn't even the fact that he got so much height off of it. It, it was so much distance and grace. It literally, I was like, I, just the, the one move, like, my eyes was like, my eyes popped. You know what I'm saying? A lot of good stuff. Of course, uh, you know, the match did end up slowing down to the Judgment Day's pace and the Judgment Day were, pretty much looking like they were going to win and then the mysterious had the classic good guy comeback which Rhea Ripley basically snuffed they were gonna do like the double 619 or something like that and uh <laughs> Rhea Ripley tripped them both up uh so they kind of just snuffed their comeback out and then basically it was like just when you thought it was all over you know Edge his music hits right uh oh the promo that we saw the vignette that we saw it's Edge surprise surprise you know the crowd you know, still had a huge pop though, and Edge makes his return. He comes down the ring, you know, big boots, Damian Priest, like they meet like halfway in the ring, big boots him to oblivion, comes down, spears Finn Balor, uh, sets him up perfectly for the six one nine. The Mysterios hit the double six one nine on Finn Balor, they get the win, easy peasy. Uh overall, good match. It was entertaining for sure. Um I, I definitely don't know if I want to see any more of it, though. Uh, maybe Judgment Day can face other people or actually be contenders in the tag picture or something. I, I you know, But to me, it just I would hate to see the Judgment Day formed just so they can harass the Mysterios for a little bit and then basically just go back to being nothing, right? Um, so hopefully they do something more with the Judgment Day as time goes on. The next match was Baron Corbin versus Pat McAfee, and honestly, this match was nothing to write home about at all. It was actually a waste of a match. The only match that this show could have gone completely without and nobody would have cared at all. Of course, Pat McAfee won, even though he shouldn't have, he shouldn't win any of his matches that he's ever won. Um, but he's a star, and he brings recognition to WWE from other angles and stuff like that, so I get it. But I just hate celebrity matches. When you talk about, and this is the difference here, between when you talk about Logan Paul and you talk about Pat McAfee. Logan Paul's a 27-year-old who is actually signed by WWE, who seems to be taking it seriously. We know that he is a very athletic individual, and he's at a point where he could be a legitimate wrestler. I don't know if it's uh, just a celebrity thing with him or not. You know, obviously there's a little bit of that in there with his like 20 something million subscribers tuning in, you know, across all of his platforms to, to see what he's doing. But there's at least potential for him to actually be a long term WWE superstar. There is no potential for Pat McAfee. He's a he's a retired kicker from the NFL. He's old. He's past his prime. He's not in ring shape whatsoever. He's he was botching everything and they really should avoid putting him in the ring at all costs. 
Uh, I get why they do it, but it's just, you know, if you're going to do that, don't waste a SummerSlam spot on that. Maybe uh, have that match at Clash at the Castle or, like, literally, like, anything else. But you have, like, your top five pay-per-views, you know, WrestleMania, Money in the Bank, SummerSlam, Survivor Series, Royal Rumble. It's like, don't have that. that You're just wasting a match, right? Maybe have it at Royal Rumble because you're using so many bodies in the actual Royal Rumble and you need, like, some filler matches. Maybe you have it at that one. But other than that, like, it's just, it was a total waste of time. Uh, and, of course, then between that uh, and, and the next matching, we had Drew McIntyre basically came out just to say, hey, uh, whoever wins on Brock Lesnar and Roman Reigns, uh, I'm going to uh, beat him at Clash of the Castle. No, you're not. You're just not. It doesn't matter. Even if Brock Lesnar wins and they decide to end Roman Reigns, you know, dominant reign of terror right now, you're still not going to beat him. All right? So <laughs> it just felt very weak. Waste of time. But I guess it was just enough to allow them to clear off some of the debris or whatever for the Street Profits versus the Usos. And speaking of which, uh, that match, I'll be honest, wasn't nearly as good as the one they put on at Money in the Bank. Um, probably because we knew uh, it had a special guest referee, which means that clearly there's going to be some sort of shenanigans. Like The special guest referees are always just more involved than they probably should be. And so for that fact alone, you know that it, like nothing's really going to change there. And also you just knew that the Usos weren't going to lose the title just yet. If they weren't going to, if they didn't pull the trigger on the Street Profits at Money in the Bank, they're not going to do it here at SummerSlam. Like at least at Money in the Bank, you thought, hmm, maybe they pull the trigger now because you have Roman Reigns facing Brock at SummerSlam and then maybe Roman, who knows, who knows? But here, it's like because they didn't do it at Money in the Bank, you knew it wasn't going to happen here. So it just kind of wasn't that exciting to see all of the same spots because you just knew the result of the match before you ever watched the match. So a after the Street Profits versus the Usos, we had <laughs> Matt Riddle came out and was like, Hey, I may not be medically cleared, but I don't take being bullied or whatever. And then he called Seth Rollins out. Seth Rollins comes out. They have like a brawl. And then Seth Rollins gives another curb stomp in like 30 seconds. And then Seth Rollins <laughs> walks out. And it was like, it was really weird. It was just like, <laughs> like, okay, well, first of all, if he wasn't actually medically clear, then you wouldn't have had that brawl. So why didn't you have the match? Um, and, of course, the reason you didn't have a match is because neither of them can are really in a position where they can lose right now. Um, but it's just like, why do you even have that brawl? Then? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> following match, though, Ronda Rousey versus Liv Morgan. And, honestly, this one ended probably in the only way that it could. Going into the match, I thought 100% Ronda Rousey is going to win this. There's no way that Liv Morgan can retain this title. And somehow they were able to basically give Ronda Rousey the clean win while having Liv Morgan retain the title. Now, I'll be honest, and some people might hate me for this, but I am not a Liv Morgan fan. And not that I'm not a, not that I'm against Liv Morgan, but she's not a champion. She's not there. Her in-ring ability is not there. Her promo ability is not there. Um, I don't even think that Ronda's promo ability is there. And I don't think that Ronda is quite as polished enough to be there. But Ronda is definitely <laughs> better equipped to be champion than Liv Morgan is. So, to me, I just thought that they were just going to put the, the title back on Ronda. They were going to give everyone what they wanted and give, you know, have Liv be the champ for a month. And then they were going to just take the title off of her and be done with it. But... I think what they realized was that if they take the title off of Liv at the moment, uh, fans are going to riot. <laughs> so what they did was they had Ronda dominate the entire match, which, by the way, was a rough match to watch. And it was basically because Liv Morgan was botching the whole thing. Every time, like, Ronda had to literally drag Liv's body to the proper spot where it needed to be for her to do arm bars because Liv just was not doing anything right. It was actually ticking me off. You could tell that Ronda Ronda does everything with like 110% speed. She's the Brock Lesnar of the women's division. She's so freaky athletic and explosive. And Liv Morgan is not equipped to be in the ring with that. 
And so <laughs> Ronda was was literally carrying that match. And so she dominated the entire match. And basically how it ended was she put her in an arm bar. And as Liv was like up, she basically had Ronda's like body like like angled like this. And her shoulders were down at the mat. So the ref starts counting to three. But as he hit the two count, Liv Morgan was tapping up here, like way up here, right, to, to the arm bar. So Liv Morgan technically tapped out before Ronda was pinned to a count of three. So Ronda technically won that match, but the ref didn't see it. So uh, Liv got awarded the victory, and she retains her title. But now everyone in the WWE Universe knows that clearly Ronda was cheated. Afterwards, Ronda actually attacked the ref, which was crazy enough. Um, but it was like, clearly Ronda is cheated. This is, you know, Liv is not going to have that title for forever. And I think it's a good way for WWE to kind of set the expectation in fans' minds to know that, hey, man, we're going to take this title off of Liv Morgan. We're not doing it tonight because we know you guys would riot if we just totally took it away from her, just ripped the carpet out from underneath her. But we tug in the carpet a little bit so that y'all know that the carpet is going to be pulled so that you can brace yourselves for it, for it, so that way when it gets pulled, you know, just fall flat on your face, all right? <laughs> you at least put your hands up, you know what I'm saying? Protect yourself. And then, of course, that brings us to the main event, Roman Reigns versus Brock Lesnar. You know, Roman Reigns, at this point, he's champ for 680 days. It's like, you kind of know Roman's going to win, especially with the Usos retaining. He's champion for 680 days. It's like, he might as well go to 700. Right, <laughs> you, you know, you might as well give him the extra month and, and at least not lose the title until Clash of the Castle, which you know he's not gonna he's not gonna lose the title on anything that isn't a big five pay per view. So, you know, but it's like you might as well get him to seven hundred days. It's, you know that Roman Reigns is not going to lose here tonight. It's a last man standing match, uh, but there is a lot of noteworthy things that happened. So first of all, as Brock Lesnar was making it, Roman Reigns entered first. As Brock Lesnar was making it, Roman Reigns entered first, sorry, with the Usos and Paul Heyman by his side. As as Brock Lesnar was coming down, all of a sudden they, they make note of this like giant tractor that just somehow snuck its way onto the set, right? Uh, which then Brock hopped in and drove to the ring. He sets the front loader up like over the, the, uh, the ropes, to where it's kind of like partially in the ring. And he climbs up on top of it, does his own intro on the mic, and then as they're doing Roman Reigns' intro and he's holding up his titles, Brock Lesnar just dives off of the front loader onto Roman Reigns, and that's how they started the match. All right? That was how that was how they started the match. And then, of course, the action quickly went into the stands, as like every last man standing match does. And pet peeve here, all right? All of the fans I noticed were watching it through their phones like they were recording it but they weren't like recording it like this right they were recording it like this where they're where they were, they were watching it through their phones the whole thing is right here in front of you you have these six foot tall giants of men fighting right here in front of you and you're watching it through a five inch screen <laughs> there were even some people that were turning away from them so they could get the selfie action going. It's like just live, just live in the moment, guys. <laughs> like, what are you doing? If you want, if you wanted to record, you can. Trust me, it's very, it's hard to mess up recording. Okay, just hold the camera like this. You're gonna get the shot. All right, especially with cameras nowadays and how wide the angles are. Just hold the camera like this. You're gonna get the shot and just watch it, enjoy it. You know what I'm saying? These guys are focused on their. <laughs> phones the things happen two feet in front of their face i don't understand it man i don't understand it you do you know how expensive those tickets are especially where those people were in the stands right like in the front rows in in the camera because you know you pay more for being in camera view right so front row camera view or first three rows camera view you're paying probably thousands of dollars for those tickets probably a thousand dollars for those tickets and you're sitting here watching like this through your phone bro oh sorry that now that that rants out of the way, uh, but yeah, <laughs> the the match was actually pretty intense. Stuff that I've never seen before in my entire life. First of all, they had some of the most vicious like ch like table spots that I've seen in a while. Like not just like crashing through tables, like getting slammed through tables. Uh, like Brock Lesnar's back was like bleeding because he had been put through tables like there were like little chips of wood like going into his back. I mean it was it was 
crazy. It was crazy. Um, and there was at one point in time where Brock had picked up a, like a piece of a broken table that still had like the lace attached to it and just whack, just <laughs> nailed Roman Reigns like over the top of the dome with it. Um, and that wasn't even, that's not even where it started to get crazy by far. The highlight of the night was at one point Brock gets back into the tractor while Roman's in the ring. He takes the, <laughs> the front loader down, right? He like rams it into the ring and the ring, the whole ring shifts like five feet. Then he backs up, rams it into the, like underneath the ring and lifts the entire ring up. So the whole ring, you got to go. I'm sure there's probably already Google images and everything of it. The whole ring is like out. It like chucks the, the ref like falls out. The Roman Reigns falls out. Everybody like slides out of the ring. It's unusable. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's unrecognizable at this point. Um, and that's when, then that's just when the carnage begins. Okay. Uh, at, at that point, like so much happened. First of all, Paul Heyman got F5 through the announce table. So that was like crazy to watch, you know, uh, then like after so much of the match had gone by, then the Usos, I was wondering when they would get involved. And I was like, did they just like come out with him and then go backstage? Like I was really confused to where they were the whole match. All of a sudden, then they get involved. You know, start start triple team and Brock Lesnar, and then Austin Theory does come out. Like he actually does come out with the briefcase and he whacks Roman Reigns over the head with it. And he's like, "Yeah, I'm gonna cash in." And the ref is like holding the briefcase, and the ref sees Brock Lesnar behind him, and he just <laughs> he goes, "Oh crap!" And he just drops the briefcase and runs. And 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 <laughs> Brock Lesnar by that point has already picked up uh, Austin Theory. Austin Theory's like, "Oh my god." <laughs> and he F5s him into oblivion, and we don't see Austin. I mean, we see his lifeless body, but we he doesn't move for the rest of the match. And um, then at one point, like, Roman Reigns picks up the briefcase and smashes Brock Lesnar over the head with it. And then he's got the titles. He's smashing Brock Lesnar over the head with those. And then finally, they end up, like, of all the broken tables and the announce table and all the chairs and the steel steps and everything. And they start – the Usos and Roman Reigns, they start piling that stuff on top of Brock Lesnar. And then Roman Reigns is standing on top of it. So, of course, he can't physically get up to the count of ten. Um, and so – you know, that's how Roman Reigns ends up winning that match. It was entertaining. I'm not going to lie. Um, the match is a whole, I, I will say this. I, it's like a part of me is like tired of seeing Roman Reigns versus Brock Lesnar because it's like, you know, like how many times are we going to see Roman Reigns versus Brock Lesnar for the WWE Universal Title Championship Ultra Mega Title? Okay. Um, but at the same time, it's like, man, the, every time they put on such good quality championship main event caliber matches. Like, it's just that nice, like, slow, methodical pace, but still, like, destroying each other. And it's like they're one of, uh, you know, two or three people that can do it. Maybe them and, like... Bobby Lashley or something like there's just not many people that can have that style of a match consistently and as good as they do it they work so well together and you know it, it's it's so entertaining every single time so it's like a part of me is like tired of seeing them but it's like another part of me is like you know honestly they could do it again at Royal Rumble and I wouldn't be too upset <laughs> um all of that said, though, you know, SummerSlam, I thought SummerSlam was going to be a total crap show tonight because of everything happening with Vince McMahon retiring and then Triple H coming back all in the same week. Usually, you know, especially these big five shows, right? These things are pretty much like planned and booked and set in stone, like pardon injury. They're already like set in stone by the time this week comes around. So I wasn't expecting to really see much Triple H influence um, with this show, and I was basically, you know, not expecting to see much Vince McMahon influence either. I was expecting them basically just like throw these matches out there and not really give a crap about what happens in the storyline, and we're just gonna hit the reset button, you know, on Monday Night Raw. But you actually got to see some Triple H influence. I mean, you got to see uh, Liv Morgan retaining, but still Ronda Rousey looking strong. I feel like that's definitely Triple H has something to do with that, you know. Bailey returning something like that. Like I feel like that's definitely Triple H influence. Becky maybe turning face is like definitely 
Triple H influence. So you got to see it was like a little bit of a changing of a guard's pay-per-view, which I really wasn't expecting it to be, or sorry, premium live event, which I really wasn't expecting to be. I thought it was just going to be like a totally discarded show and that I was basically just watching like an absolutely pointless three hours of wrestling. Uh, but it wasn't. It wasn't. I feel invested in the matches. I feel like the storylines came out how they should. And they did the best with what they had and with the notice that they had it in. Um, I definitely am excited to see what they're going to do at Clash of the Castle or whatever they're calling that. And I'm definitely excited to see the direction that they go with some of this talent in the future. Especially now that you know Triple H is back and he's running things as ta- you know head of talent relations. And you expect him to you know get back into the hang of that role even more as time goes along. So I'm excited to see what happens. I think that we're truly going to witness uh, uh, the start of a new era with WWE right now, with them going TV 14 with triple H uh, or sorry, with Vince McMahon finally retiring triple H kind of taking over the head of relations part of it, your talent relations part, you're going to start seeing champions that don't fit that typical, you know, big, tall, brooding, powerful, you know, absolutely muscle-bound guy. You're going to start seeing, you know, more good, talented promo work. And I hope that they do more things with talent like Tommaso Ciampa and Finn Balor and and Austin Theory and, you know, those those guys that are really the future of this company. Uh, people don't want to say it or anything like that, but it's like if Logan Paul takes this seriously at the age of 27, he's definitely the future of this company. If Austin Theory, even if he does, like, if Austin, Austin Theory is at a point where his, his promo work is good. He's proven he can draw heat. He's proven that his, his in-ring skills are good. He can have good matches. Really, the only thing about Austin Theory is if he can stay off of drugs and if he can stay out of legal trouble, he will be the, the, a part of this company's future. He will be a household name when it comes to WWE in another 10 years. Will he be at the top of the card? I don't know, but he will definitely be in WWE for as long as he wants to be. So uh, I, we should get used to seeing more theory. I look forward to seeing more theory. Uh, I look forward to seeing more of, of everything that's going to happen, you know, with the new factions and everything we've seen tonight, but that's really enough out, out of me. SummerSlam, Overall, I would give it a, I would give it, you know, it was a good show. It was definitely better than I thought it was going to be, especially considering the fact that I pretty much thought like none of the matches surprised me. All of the matches ended exactly how they should have. Like they were, they were basically put in a situation where like no one could win the, the match. The results of the matches couldn't really be any other way. So um, given that they still were able to make it interesting and entertaining and still had me tuning into it the entire time. So for that, I'd say it's a good show, and, you know, and the matches, the quality of matches, as always, were good. But again, just not like, not fantastic, uh, except for that main event. That main event was really good, and Becky versus uh, Bianca was a really good quality match. Uh, that being said, man, I- I'm going to leave this alone for you guys. Let me know in the comments if you guys like me doing these recaps of like the pay-per-views. Uh, if you don't, I'll stop doing them. It's no big deal to me. It's just something that I thought would be cool to do. Uh, That being said, though, I will see you guys in the next episode. I love y'all. Stay safe. Peace.